To the No Life Jackets podcast thing with uh, with me, Brian. I got my buddy Zach here uh, to answer a bunch Present. of questions. Mm-hmm. And we're all here uh, today because uh, I always want to ask a bunch of random questions that would be really awkward if I asked during a normal social situation. So uh, we're just gonna we're gonna be bopping right in this. Before we do that, we probably should do a little introduction. Uh, so Zach, uh, just give just give me the quick uh, you know spark notes. Introduce yourself. Uh, for that audience uh, quick spark notes introduction man what what a stage to step onto i mean what do you want to know where do you want to start mm, i'm 22 well, years old well let's see, a let's young see female here. single <laughs> looking to mingle all right yeah. well well let, well let's see let's get let's get the basics right let's see so so you, you stream you do stuff around right mr professional for audio sure. setup over there yeah if i were to give you uh let's just say the the description right under my name i'd say uh, video gamer, cryptocurrency entrepreneur, and uh, maybe throw in a little hiking, adventuring in there as well. And I stream when I am really bored. I like but, it. yeah, I think if you had to put a little footnotes, I think those are the main points you want to be talking about. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. Now, another important thing I think we got to cover is uh, kind of roughly-ish how we know each other. So I think what we can do here is just a little section about how we, how we met in college, right? So, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, I'll, like I'll, give, I'll give you my side of things. Then you can go from your side of things. We'll see if it's any different. So from okay, my side okay. of things, right, we come, we come in freshman year to a, to a, a good Christian, Christian school, as you do in the Midwest. And uh, it's that first two-week period where all the freshmen are just, like, throwing their pheromones out, throwing swag, hoping to get some friends. Figuring out who they are. Because nobody has any friends. And everybody's just like, oh, my God, I hope I, I have friends after this period ends. And, uh... Yeah, you were kind of like, like I had absolutely no expectation that I would ever be friends with you, because like you were walking around campus with your like American bandana doing parkour shit. No one knew your name. You were just parkour guy, and uh, yeah. you were you you were built like Slam. a tank, right? And I I I've never <laughs> hang out with anyone who was built like a tank at that point. So I had absolutely no expectation. Oh, 130 I was like, pounds of you. I was like, yeah, he's just gonna be this like mythical figure that'll like uh, you know be around campus sometimes, and then I'll have my nerd friends or whatever. And then I realized you were the biggest nerd, both physically and metaphorically speaking, around. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of what I remember. What do you what do you remember from those early days? Oh, coming in freshman year, fresh bo fresh boots on the beaches. Oh, it was a great time, truly glorious. Uh, yeah, I would say I came in with a very centric mindset. I really only saw me and what I did. Not too much about what really went on around me. I kind of focused on me and what I did. And so a lot of people told me things about me uh, that I didn't even know. They're like, man, you're the parkour guy. I'm like, I am? Oh, I didn't know I was the parkour guy. <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah. I'm like, hey, we'll do a backflip. I'm like, oh, sure, I, I'll do a backflip for you. And I'll do a backflip. They'll all applaud and I'll smile and I'll walk away. Oh, I'll cheer you treat, and cheerful. You catch it in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I also never walked anywhere. I was pretty much like either jogging or on a bike. And I would drift like directly up to the front door and uh, park and leave. I took no time walking. I lived my life very fast. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I definitely understand the uh, perspective that I do not look like a gamer. I, didn't, I did not be perceived as a gamer. All through high school, I played football and was a tri-sport athlete. But every single spare minute I had, I wasn't doing that. I was basically gaming. So uh, <laughs> very deceptive, kind of a chameleon hiding in sheep's clothing. Very sneaky. It was, it was, it was, it was quite sneaky. Very much so. Yeah, that's, that's right. how I got there. But what I perceived from Brian, though, oh, coming in oh. uh, more or less where we first glanced eyes, I can't really say for certain, but I might just be in the accounting room. I can't say for certain where the first, where first contact was made. But both of us were business majors uh, at this quiet Christian school. And uh, one of the classes we had first, both first started with on the second day of classes was a 7.20 a.m. accounting class. And so... Great. Went on for an hour and 40 minutes straight. It was just balling, balling class. It sounds awful, but actually it was probably one of my favorite classes. It was a, it was a fun time. It Professor was, was a young dude, 28 or something, if I recall. Oh, young guy, yeah. had a lot of energy. Roloff was, was his best. name. Oh, fun time. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fun time. And uh, yeah, we sat next to each other. I believe I was sitting first, and I think Brian saw me and sat down. 
Yeah. I can't quite recall why. Do you know why? Why why did you sit well, there? Well, I think uh I'm trying to remember. It's a seven twenty. I think I got there late because I had to walk all the way from uh from the Aiken to the block away where I live, but I plopped on down. I think it was literally just like, Oh, I I've recognized this person at some point. And you I think you had your laptop yeah. out and I'm like, Oh, he has a laptop. I mean can't can't go wrong sitting next to that <laughs> opportunity. Opportunity. I what I do remember from that accounting class most though, is uh, is uh, the slight rivalry we had going on the tests because neither of us gave a fuck about homework, but tests. Now that was our pride and joy, right? We're going at. <laughs> that I was remember, where we showed up. Yeah, the, the heavyweight the first, matching. Exactly the first test, right? And we're 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 not exactly the most engaged students on your average basis, but we're our IQs are off the charts. All right. So, uh, so we got, I think we got like a 98%, right? And we both only got one question wrong and it was the same question and it was multiple choice and we got it wrong in the exact same way while sitting next to each other. While sitting right so, next to each other. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> it was an interesting one. We actually didn't cheat, but you know, I kind of wish we did because no one's going to believe me that we didn't anyway. So I know. Yeah. it seems so <laughs> suspicious. And I think part of that is because whenever we either were studying accounting, we were either in those seats, like talk, looking at the teacher and uh, talking things over, we were always in the same groups. And so most of our fundamental knowledge was generally kind of shared. We both kind of talked to the same conclusions. And so for most of accounting, we usually, if we were wrong, we were wrong the same way. Yep. And so we, we always sat rather close, if not next to each other. So mm -hmm. it was always suspicious. And yep. uh, we had another t professor later on in a later, more advanced accounting course. I'm amazed he didn't call us on something. Although I suppose yep. it was kind of physically impossible for us to really be cheating effectively, but... We always still yeah. just got everything wrong the exact same way. Yeah. If four, if there were four or five questions, I mean, the answer is B, we both put C. <laughs> like, if we're getting it wrong, we're getting it wrong the exact same way. Every time. But, yeah, so it's, we're basically an echo chamber right here. So, uh, you know, it, I, I'm basically just interviewing myself, you know, if I weighed twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just asking myself questions, and they're a part of me is answering. Exactly. This, that, that's why we're going for this. Anyway. All right, so now we, we get, we've covered a little background, so we're just going to jump right into this. All right, this is we're going into the no life jacket section. So we're going to start off here. I'm going to start off with, with a bit of a bang. Are you prepared for this, Zach? I'm prepared. Gotcha. All right, rank you and your siblings in the order your parents love them the most. Hmm. hmm. Well, well, he can, thinks, so, define... thinks it's over a bit. I'll give you a little bit of context. He has four siblings. All right? Yes, I, I have four siblings. Oh, if you count, well, if you count yourself, yeah. Four, four of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, three siblings, uh, two older brothers, and a younger sister. Uh, yeah, and then, so of course, I have I my list, have... right? Because I, because I, I, I took a guess on this one, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, I'm gonna if see I had to see, right. it's really my parents, or unlike all parents are, really anal about making sure that no one ever compares their children mm. against each other. Like they always, and so from my mom, I truly cannot say I don't think she actually has literally any preference. We are all just her spawn. And like we are just little chicklets. You are an amorphous spawn. No matter we're her. we're six foot three chicklets, but we're still chicklets than, the, than all the same. My dad though, he has his days. Clearly. Sometimes you can definitely tell he's more annoyed with one of his siblings with one of his uh children than the other. Mm -hmm. But if I had to like, if we were putting it like there's a steamroller coming down the road. All mm -hmm. the kids are are strapped down Lined waist up. to waist. You mm -hmm. can only save a certain amount of them. What's your order of operations? Mm -hmm. I feel like they would probably I mean, honestly, like, the difficulty of this question is they would both rather lay in front of the steamroller than choose. So like, it's really difficult to get an answer. Clearly, clearly. We're, just, we're, we're injecting a whole lot of greed into your parents that doesn't yeah. exist here for the purpose of this question. Yeah, if, they, if, it, was a, if it was a split-second decision and they just had to do something and maybe they just were rushed and they didn't really get much time, I think the first person I'm probably going to save, I bet, I bet it would be Emily because she needs saving the most. Mm -hmm. As in, physically speaking, she will die the fastest. Compared to all of us, we are the more resilient people. Um, mm -hmm. My sister doesn't have a problem, no health problems like that, but like she's generally going to get herself killed way sooner. So she definitely has that more motherly instinct of needing to protect her. Yeah. So I feel like that would kick in, and gotcha. that would be the first one they try to save. Right. But if they had time to like make a, a rational decision, yeah, right. Yeah, I feel like they're saving Josh because by not saving Josh, you're killing the most. Josh, my oldest brother. But he's also got three mouths to feed. Well, four if you count his lovely wife. Straight, so straight facts. You're right? killing really five people by not choosing Josh. That's mm -hmm. the decision my dad would probably have to come to. It is the most numerically correct decision. And mind you, a little context here: my dad was an accountant for most of his life and career. He's not mm -hmm. currently an accountant. He's working in supply chain. But 
very logical. If it comes down to it and he needs to make a difficult decision, he's going to make it with as much he's quantitative popping. evidence as he can. Clear. Now, whether or not you can convince my mom of any of this is his, his battle, not mine. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if that's ever going to work. <laughs> for but sure, the rest for sure. of us, I mean, the rest of us, I'm pretty sure he would all, it's pretty much like his only thing he'd focus and laser on is I got to save the most. Josh Gatz could save. Yeah, I think, if we don't I think, save Josh, I think, I think you're probably over. right. Yeah, I was, th- I was thinking about this I think less I might in the context be... of life or death and more, yeah. and more like, oh, we, we, we're forcing them to sit down and, uh, you know, make a full accounting. They have to put them in a list. And so uh, Josh was, def- was definitely at the top of my list, too. I think, I think 100% mm-hmm. that man, like, I don't know, values-wise, like, family success-wise, oh, yeah, your parents definitely love him. There's a lot on his shoulders. And oh, they, yeah. Uh, plus, he's definitely the closest with all of them as far as, like, mm-hmm. wh- yeah. where he is in life. Like, he's mm. the fellow dad. Yeah, but. For sure. I think I couldn't tell if it'd be me or Brian lower on the list. I think they would choose Brian like as the lowest because he's lived a lot of life. He's made a lot yeah. of his own decisions. You get, so you get a lot he, he's, a, yeah. he's not much older than me. He's only 19 months older than I am and me coming in. I'm currently 24. Mm-hmm. Almost be 25. Not too long from now. But uh, he turned 26 this last uh, spring. And mm-hmm. so he's not the oldest. Josh is 28 right now. He's about to be 29. Um, but Brian is, uh, he's lived a lot of life. He's been a very adventurous lifestyle, made a lot of mistakes, probably 15 concussions. Like he, he's, he's made his bed kind yeah. of, kind of mindset. Exactly. Uh, I think they might exactly. let me die most because they know I'm probably the most accepted with the possibility that I'm fine. If I die, I, you know, ha- I've lived, it, I've lived a good. long life in my own eyes. I yeah, think I think they know my dad knows that at the very least. Yeah. If you're lined up in front of a steamroller, I think you're probably right. Yeah. I think, I, I think they know that you're, you'd be the most okay with getting sacrificed for your sibling. <laughs> they'd be the most okay with like uh, not being loved. I think yeah, they'd, sure. if they were to rate this on like a tree or like a tier list, they would have to choose the people who need the love the most because that's what they give the most then too. Which is kind of a hard, that, that, that a hard you, that line. Fit, that but, fits your parents a lot. That, that's definitely. Yeah, I say, that's why I think my sister definitely would be like the, one of the first because of just pure emotional mm. love. It's uh, she needs the love the most. Yeah, I that's think. a so good that point. kind of by necessity means that they'll save her the most. But that that's is, about that a life is, and death situation. It's uh, yeah, because it's a hard yes. thing to analyze in its own context. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, what I had, I had, I had Josh, Josh first, obviously. And then, mm-hmm. uh, I, and then I put uh, I put your brother Brian last. Uh, same reasons I suspect I suspected. As, yes, and then, I imagine. Like kind of a wash in the middle with you and Emily. If I'm thinking about it, like you know, who do they actually love the most, even though they never actually mm-hmm. admit it? Like I think you might squeak Emily out, but I don't know. It's 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 a tough one between if, you two. If it were coming from a perspective tough. of like proudness, like who they're most proud of, yeah, mm. I got Emily beat twenty yards. But uh, gotcha. when it comes to just love, love is a hard question. Exactly. Hard to really you got, you got competing that factors that are flipping it. All right. Yeah, awesome. exactly. That's why I think it would be a little hard. Yeah, for sure. All right, sweet. Well, that was, that was, the, that was the first question. Start off with a nice banger. Oh, All right. Ones. Let's keep the family theme going here. Let me grab this one. Okay. okay. So uh, what, do you, what do you think your, your, your family, maybe more specifically your parents, think of uh, the trophy husband life you find yourself living at the moment? As you have your, um, your business-savvy killer wife out there uh, yeah. making bank. Yeah, I think with uh, – they both – I'd say – I don't have to discuss with them both, so I actually just know the answer to the question. Okay. It's really easy. Uh, they say they're just significantly more envious that I have this <laughs> choice I could make. Most people get put in a position where they can kind of basically do whatever they want. Mm-hmm. They, are, they usually are forced to do something, whether it be like, I need food, so I, should, I have to work. I need money because I want to do these things. Therefore, I have to work. But if you can create enough money that you don't need anymore, and you like you're making more than enough, more than goes out, why, why stress about just trying to get as much money as you can? There are other valuable things. Mm. And like when I told that to them, they're like, "Huh? Well, I mean, I suppose if I was in your position, that makes sense. Yeah. Most people have, you know, kids. Feed. I don't have any kids. Basically, just married gotcha. for two years, twenty-four years old. I don't got a lot of expenses." Student it's debt, true. But thanks to our current government situation, that's uh, nice not being paid. Uh, gotcha. But I think when it comes to that, my dad said like mostly he's just like I'm like amazed that I'm able to still make as much money as I do while not like actively full time working. Into my revenue sources, I really only put ten to fifteen hours a week into it. Don't spend that much time worrying about it, and it's still I make more now than I did when I was working forty, forty, fifty. Like so, mm-hmm. it's it's pretty amazing. To him in that regard, but my mom, nice. yeah, my mom's pumped about it. She's like, yeah, I wish I could do it. Cool. <laughs> I honestly wish I could have. 
Nice. Yeah. yeah I made a I'm different decisions in life than that. a lot of people do. Mm. When you do, when you actively choose, you don't want to have kids. Uh, you financially have a lot more avenues you can pursue. You can start for businesses. Sure. You can do a lot of other things because kids are expensive. Yeah, for sure. Gotcha. Yeah, that was something that I was that I was curious about. Just because, like, like I feel like it's something that your parents would be pretty chill with. But you know, you got like that that like two harbors mining town work ethic sort of thing. Yep. So I like I I could just never imagine you like actually going back to your parents and your dad's not your dad not giving you shit for it. Uh, but at the same <laughs> time. They're probably okay with it, you know. I feel like he—he you know, if he literally sounds significantly more envious than anything. <laughs> like he's more just like I can totally I I like could, uh, honestly. I wish honestly, I could do that. <laughs> I I feel I feel like I feel like your your dad is the is the, like prime guy who if he could like be like a a radio host, right? Like he gets up at five thirty a.m. Mm-hmm. D- does like a rush hour commuter radio program. That would I think that would be his prime job right there. Oh yeah. Oh he. He's a big people person. He likes oh, yeah. to just talk. He likes to talk to people about anything. And a big thing, he, he likes to work. He likes to work a full 10-hour day, fall asleep, mm. simple kind of mindset where I get up, I do my work, I work out and do something for you know, leisure, and I go to bed. I repeat forever mm. into perpetuity. And I take a vacation <laughs> once or twice a year. That's, that's like my dad's complete bread and butter nice. mindset. So it makes, your assumptions make a lot of sense. <laughs> if, he, he's, if he could be a golf uh, like a golf announcer, all he does is like talk about golf all day. That's what he would do if he had a choice. But mm-hmm. I don't think that job is currently gotcha. vacant. Gotcha. All right. So I got, it's a bit of a corollary on top of that one. But okay, like, okay. so you, one, you, you, you got this like unconventional type of t- type of lifestyle here. And do you think if your brother Brian hadn't blazed that unconventional trail, so to speak, in your family, do you think you would have had some more resistance along those kinds of lines? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a point to be made there. I do. I'm a big believer in through uh, through adversity you can become stronger, especially as a lot of my, of my mentality, both me and my brother tend to share. Through adversity, you definitely become stronger. But Brian didn't have a lot of adversity, so he kind of went and created his own adversity. He had a pretty <laughs> soft lifestyle. We've always been middle class, upper middle class lifestyle. Like we financially, our family's never really been in any peril. No one's ever had like a sickness problem. Like generally, we've all just been pretty healthy. And so Brian almost, I feel like, since the, he could weather the storm, he went in. Like, he's oh, yeah. like, I can weather the storm, therefore, I'm going into the storm. He, he made a pretty difficult life for himself, but he regrets none of it. He is, mm-hmm. If he regrets anything, it's over. The whole facade cracks. He's just going headfirst into the storm. So mm-hmm. he's, he's if, he, awesome. if, he, if he didn't have that luxury, yeah, he definitely would have turned out, I wouldn't say better or worse. But different. He would have definitely been much more like the classic forty hours business guy. That's the mm-hmm. route. That was the avenue he was he was driving down, and mm-hmm. then about turned eighteen, nineteen, and he's like, hard right. <laughs> hard right. I, I'm 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 committed to the other one. I'm not gotcha. I'm not going into this one. He went to, he went to university for a full a full semester almost. He was registered for the whole semester, but he actually ended up coming back three quarters of the way through or so. Yeah, gotcha. I'm just imagining this alternate Ford universe university. where Brian's like an accountant. And then, and now, like, I, I, I feel like, I don't know, I feel like that would have almost forced you to, forced you to just go even more, like, alternative. Like, I, I feel like a piercing would be in the cards for you at this point. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I feel like if Brian found out, like, found significant more success, some more, like, the lifestyle I've kind of paved, I would have to just pave a more successful lifestyle. I, I, I find my, I'm a very competitive mindset. Oh, when yeah. I got to the finish line of, well, I suppose where I am, I looked around and I saw no peers to my left or right. So I'm like, huh, I'm in front. I'm out. Like, I broke free. 100%. I'm, on, I'm, 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 in the, I'm leading the I race. To, I, I well, to, Josh I totally just turned is doing a different race. I t- but, exactly. I get it, right? You either, like, you're, you, when, you're, when, you get, when you're a certain level of competitive, you're, you're not like, oh, I don't necessarily need to be better than these people if I run a different race. Right? It's like, it's like when, yeah. we, when we play video games and I decide to just do my own stupid plan and see how far it goes instead of actually trying to oh, yeah. win. Right? I totally instead do Instead of that analyzing to a victory condition. Competitive nature. Yes. You create a victory condition where by simply being the best at this one thing, I have succeeded. Exactly. <laughs> That's, That's definitely how me and all my brothers think. We all just chose to specialize <clears throat> on a different race. Mm-hmm. 
Josh it's, is it's like, a good hey, idea I'm in kids. your family. I'm going to be the dad. Like, I'm winning the dad race. Exactly. I feel. I feel like if any of, if either of you guys got in the same lane, like if you got started on competing dad, right? There's going to be 16 more Demings by now. Like you're you're going to yeah. find a woman who is all ready to be a baby factory, and there's just going to be you're gonna, you're going to be like looking like get out the nutrition guide. Coffee you're like, mines. I need to keep this factory running at optimal <laughs> capacity so I can have more kids than my brother. Because victory is its own reward. <laughs> exactly. All right. Yeah. Awesome. And then they have Brian, he just turned off. He's just like, I can't win this race. I'm going to go specialize in a different And mm -hmm. he, he lives a completely different kind of fun. Like, oh, yeah. He's going he's to awesome. every single festival that's on in the country. Mm -hmm. And when he does, actually, is he, this, isn't a, this isn't a nuanced thing. Like, this is a pretty simple job. You drive golf carts. <laughs> Either you contract it or maybe you know a guy, but you just go and be the person driving the golf carts. Mm -hmm. And sure, you don't get to have the most fun, but you also don't have to pay for tickets. You usually get to just enjoy the actual whole event without – all you have to do is drive people around him. He, if Brian yeah. was I really, a taxi driver, I really, like I the really appreciate how, how, he, how he's popped this. And he's just like, this is, this is kind of what I want to do. This is very much adjacent. I've, I've done it, right? You just go out, yep. you find the thing that you need to do to accomplish what you want, and you do it. And he's just a fantastic example of that. He's a killer. Yeah. All right. We're going to hop to another to another question oh, here. This one. Okay, okay. So we're going back into, into your history, Zach. The, the mysterious mm. history, the origin stories. What was the most formative time or event in your life so far, right? And it doesn't have to be one thing or one time period necessarily, right? There could be a couple, but like. Maybe maybe a period where you're like, hey, before this, I was this kind of person, and after this event, yeah, I kind of figured shatter this points out. almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. I would say there are two big ones, and maybe three. What was that? But a third one's like an. Gotcha. Say. I'll start with the honorable mention. Um, mm -hmm. It was summer camp. I went to a Christian summer camp. Grew up mm -hmm. Christians our whole life. Um, that was really popular in the area. I'm not going to say where because I still know a lot of people who work there. <laughs> but really popular in the area. And uh, generally, there would be about 300 to 500 campers per week. And they'd swap out every week. I was a counselor there and a lifeguard. And mm -hmm. so I did that all volunteer. You don't get paid. Sad. Well, some do. Some of the people do get paid. But the, the teenagers definitely don't. Because I would have been, oh, well, let's see, summer of 10th grade. Something like a six, about to turn 16. So 15 mm -hmm. to 16 year old. Gotcha. And uh, you go in. Sometimes you get paired in with another counselor because I'd be a bigger group. But uh, that whole summer of just basically... Your first time being isolated from the world you were in to a new, like, a complete environment where you sleep there, you poop there, you eat there, you never go mm -hmm. home, you shower there. If you get sick, you stay there. Like, that's, yeah. it's basically like a miniature version of college, and which is why college kind of feels like summer camp, or at least to some freshmen. And uh, I would say that was very formative, as in I just got to, like, do whatever I wanted. I, if I wanted to eat this food, I could. I, if I wanted to go to bed, I could. If I wanted, no one's telling you what to do, which I didn't have. My, my parents aren't very uh, helicopter parenty. They generally let a trust, at least me, to do my own thing. But uh, for at summer camp, you really can do whatever you want. But if you make mistakes, you pay like, actual consequences. Yeah, so you have to I still do. play it smart. So that was very formative. I didn't really make any mistakes. There was one time where I, I was a pseudo mistake, but it was more a misunderstanding. I wasn't aware that you weren't allowed to have your phone in a certain area. And, uh, while I was doing it the whole time, and no one caught me. So, and not until the end, where like one of the head dudes caught me. He's like, "Hey, you can't have your phone here." And I'm like, "What do you mean? Like, I've, I've been, been doing here, this all I, summer. I, I've been here for three months, Jim. Like, no <laughs> one told me. I've been doing like I know you're not supposed to have your phone in front of the campers, but like, no, no one's here. It's like mid, it's like midnight. I can do what I want, right? But he didn't think that was very funny. Also, I didn't know who he was. I just thought he was just some dude. But no, he was like one of the head ups. So <laughs> probably not somebody you should argue with. Probably not. Rules. Yeah. <laughs> and so I didn't get any like crazy reprimands. It's basically, it's a three strike system. You get a strike, a two, three, and then third one. I got one strike for that. But it was my last week, so I really didn't care. I was like, oh, neat. Mm -hmm. uh, and but I'd say, other than that, that'd be the that'd be the runner up. I'd say that one was formative because it's your first time really tasting and using and utilizing free like, more independence gotcha. than you've ever had. Yeah, that makes sense. But I'd say other than that, between one and two. One of which is being, I would say, not my first crush, but the first crush you ever have that, like, when you're a, effectively, like, 16 year olds old up. Yeah, where, like, could, like, it means you know, a lot more. Do something. It's no longer, if... yeah, it's not like, like, if I, like, if you go in down this road, you could lead to some life-changing consequences mm -hmm. type crushing type yeah. thing. So you got to be careful. 
And yeah. so you, you start imposing you know, hormones and whatnot. Everybody makes stupid decisions. That's a great place to make stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was always a fun time. I'm not going to say who it was or really even how old I was because then yeah, yeah, people, yeah. Could, people could start to figure out. They know enough about me. There's enough oh, information yeah. out no there. Worries. No but worries. But that was pretty informative as in, like, you really start to get to understand not only, like, when you're courting somebody or, like, even just interested in somebody, it really starts to show you a lot more about who you are than you might think. Mm, like, mm -hmm. by trying to find somebody that you want to court or somebody you date or whatever, whatever your intentions are, however old mm. you are, whatever, it doesn't matter, you find out a lot more about yourself when you're assessing someone else. You may not know this. At the time, I really didn't. In hindsight, I did. I have a lot of journals. I made sure to be, I had took some, I'm glad I had some wise people raising me uh, who said, when out, just write things down always. I mean, you can always mm. go back and affect and not relive those memories, but learn much more from them. Yeah, so I've always I always journaled a lot down. And uh, I'd say the, yeah, you know, like the peak capstone of that whole like formative style. I didn't actually end up going any deep with this girl as far as like we didn't actually start dating or anything or boyfriend, girlfriend. But, uh, like, we were really, really good friends, so we didn't want to compromise something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of mutually, we both understood that, but it was complicated. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, I would walk around and just carry my journal, and I'd have a thought, write it down, close it. And then just having all my thoughts, basically, I completely go through life, it's mm -hmm. very useful. And so starting journaling, yeah. that's, like, the big event where I realized the value of I really should journal and write things down. Because you're going to make stupid decisions, and uh, trust me, I made many. Nothing with mm. crazy consequences, thankfully. I got out kind of scot-free, but I put myself into some stupid spots where some bad things can happen. Yeah, And now that sure. I can learn from that, I would have been significantly dumber and probably redone the same stupid mistakes if I didn't write it down. So gotcha. that's one of the few things where I actually like notes is in life, not necessarily in school. Yeah, but the one so I'd say the start, winner... Did you start as far journaling as, around that time when you were like 16 or whenever? Yeah, you know? about... Okay. I started journaling like in practice, maybe like when I was a ninth grader, mm. with about 14, 15-year-old. But when I started like taking it seriously and like keeping a oh, near daily log, it'd be times where I'd make four or five entries a day. Uh, yeah, yeah it was about sure. when I started going through the, my first real uh, challenge in life, which I would describe as trying to figure out who you are type thing. And Dude. especially when it comes to romance because of hormones and stuff. Mm. It makes the lot, lot, the vision gets a lot more foggy and cloudy. So when you're sitting down at night at 1 a.m., it's like reread your thoughts versus just play out an endless battle in your head with past you. Mm -hmm. So like yeah, I can I read see. and see what I was thinking. I'm like, okay, okay, I see the, the flaw in what I was doing. Yeah. I should make an effort to do better next time. For sure. I think that's, that's like a huge formative thing that if that one aspect of my past was taken out, I would be a completely different person. Mm -hmm. I would, I'd be, I have no clue what I'd be. But I'd be I know I'd be significantly different. Gotcha. Uh, and then I'd say the other formative time is whew, most of my young life is really formed up by hormones getting me into trouble. And so I did have mm -hmm. one girlfriend in high school who was, I would consider a real girlfriend, like no mm -hmm. more than just you have the name and Facebook badge, like you actually yeah. endeavor to do girlfriend, boyfriend-esque things. Mm -hmm. uh, that was pretty formative, but it didn't last very long. It was only like yeah. a summer and then I went to college and then I met everyone I'm, I know now, my life's going to be completely changed. Mm. So that's formative on a fundamental level, just going to university. You'll, you're getting completely new friend groups that you'll probably have the rest of your life, yep. and you'll meet people that are going to be significantly more important to you because you're in a much further developed stage of your life, and so are they. So you mm. can make much more meaningful connections to people than you did in high school. In high school, you kind of, I sat next to you, therefore I'm your friend. Like, yeah. Or like, you, you were nice to me that one time, <laughs> now we're friends. Like, it's not hard to get friends in high school, and if you know about how to carry yourself, but some people, mm. that's not their strength. Thankfully, yeah. I didn't have that, that uh, gotcha. struggle. But that's cool. the formative time, like the number one is definitely where I am now, where mm. I have a, I've been working for the past, oh, since 2018 as a contractor up till about early 2021, February, mm -hmm. if I recall. I was a contractor from 2018 to 2021. Um, technically for part of that I was part time because I was still in university but I was a, an yeah. intern which was just a type of contractor in a way mm -hmm. but I was a proper contract worker working in IT and data management data analytics and like accounting generally mm -hmm. for since then to date well not to date to February and uh, February to now has really shown me a lot more of what's what's really important because you're kind of sculpted your whole life to do a profession. That's really mm -hmm. what your whole life is sculpting you to do, to do a profession and provide value to the whole system. So we all can get value and receive value and give value. Like you're making value yeah. and adding value to the system. That's why everyone needs a profession. The other reason is we all need something to do. 
Now, a lot of people, and most people, I'm, I'm definitely a minority, but I'm not the only person who thinks like this. I think it's much more of a stoic mindset, is that there are more important things in life than just getting money. Mm. I have a very good friend of mine who recently started in investment banking. The dude's going to be loaded. If he, if he can pull it off, he's going to be loaded. Like He's got a full-time job, everything. Mm. He's working 80-hour weeks, but before long, he's going to have six figures and then high six-figure salaries if he keeps up with it and gets higher up in the branch. But he's selling a lot of his youth to, to gain this mass wealth. Mm-hmm. Is, that a worth thing, is that a worthy exchange? He has to ask that question at the end of the day. If he says yes, go for it. I would say no every day of the week. I hated working 40 hours for what I got. Yeah. I could have gotten, it could have doubled my pay. I would have not, I would, it would have just driven me into depression. Yeah. It's just not fun. I'm not a big, I'm not a 40, uh, an eight to five, nine to five mindset kind of guy. And so kind of learning that has made me realize that you don't have to be. You don't have to just be a nine to five kind of guy. You want to pick up a career doing something else, something that's maybe a night job, maybe something you do at nights, maybe something you work very much less for a less wage, but like you're getting more value than just money. Maybe you yeah. hone a skill, like a trade, a blue collar type thing. You're honing a skill and you can gain value by mastering that craft, that skill, that trade. There's a lot of value yeah. there and that, all that value is not money. You're not making crazy banks yeah. doing something like electricians or electronics. Electrical engineers are doing a lot and electricians Electronics make a fair wage. They're going to have gotcha. a, a good life if they can do the job well. But they take a lot more. If you ask a lot of trade workers, they do take a lot of pride in what they do. They're generally going to be a lot happier in their average life than somebody who just gets paid a lot more. Gotcha. So, like, yeah, I want to, like, I want to, like, put, push, push in on this one. Then. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Just kind of, kind, of, kind of curious, right? Because you, like, obviously, you, like, went up everything through college, right? I mean, we're both in the business department. I mean, that's where you go to, like, have a big circle jerk about, you know, making money. and Having uh, money. And be, yeah, oh, the joys of work and all that, all that, good, that good shit. Um, yeah. And so we pop, uh, we pop in, and that's kind of like the focus. And then you've just kind of gone this, under this big transformation where you decided not to do it. So like, and obviously because uh, because uh, your wife has a full time job, you're pretty, you're pretty well well yeah, set. Yeah, my situation open, allows me so to be able to make this choice. Exactly. So you didn't have to. I'm kind of I'm kind of curious how the conversations go when you were first thinking of this, right? Because obviously you're a contractor, right? So mm-hmm. you have like delays in between contracts. But like, were you just sitting around one day and the maid was like, "So yeah, I haven't been working in about two months." Uh, yeah, how you do it? Or is there like yeah. a conversation ahead of time? Because I think it's hilarious the first way. See, but, it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, I, it's really funny. I would I expect, and thankfully I've learned over the course since February to now that I've chosen a very very good wife. As in, like, we agree on a lot of fundamental things that if I didn't agree with her on these things, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing. Because I would need, she has to understand the value in which I bring just as equally as I do, or we're going to get to a discrepancy yeah. at some point. But, and like you said, my wife works a full-time job in, in banking and finance. Like, we haven't, we'll never want for some more money as far as, like, what we need. If you want better things, more expensive things, then we need more money. That's a completely different uh, circumstance. That's not where we are right now. We have more than enough money we need, and we make more than enough money that we can spend. So we, when you take out the financial pressure, you come at the conversation a lot differently. Yeah, it's more so because, sure. yeah, the way, like you're saying, the natural friction of unemployment as a contractor is you're going to have stints of like a couple weeks, month or two, maybe, where there's just no contract for you to do. Or maybe mm-hmm. nothing comes to your plate that you want to do. Maybe like, oh, I specialize in data analytics. I keep getting people coming at me for like general, like maybe like tech worker, tech work or something yeah. like that. Gotcha. Where I'm like, yeah, I, I could do your job. That was the biggest problem with the last job I worked at this contract agency is that my job had nothing to do with what I specialized in at all. I worked purely effectively as an accounting clerk. And I'm like, I can do this. Like, I have the, I have the skills and I can do the job just fine. I did it well enough that I worked myself out of it because there was no more job to do. Like, I ran out of things to give me. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm out. I, this is boring. But uh, I didn't need any of the money. So I had nothing to offer me. But the job itself was just so poorly fit for me that I was not happy. Yeah. The only truth that I can definitely say is I utterly was unhappy at that place. And I started to look at it and be like, well, what is, what do I want then? I, if I'm not happy there, what would make me happy? What position would I want to be happy? Frankly, and then yeah, we had this conversation together as a husband and wife, and uh, I'm like, if anything else, if they don't offer me a contract that I want to do, I'm just not going to accept one. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, all right, what, what should I do in the meantime? So I'm like, all right, well, thankfully I have a decent amount of money, because I I trade on the, I trade so and so. Like I said, only 10, 15 hours a week, primarily in cryptocurrency markets or in other options. Mm-hmm. I'm specialized in other things. I'm not like some uh, licensed trader. Yeah, like I'm basically just sure. making more more month by month trades. Nothing super day daily, 
but I've definitely found a lot of success, so I don't have the need to have to provide gotcha. financially. So what should I do? That's the mm-hmm. next thing you have to ask yourself. And that when you're in that circumstance, what should you do? And you ask you and you ask your wife this. Mm-hmm. She has equal say in what I do and just as much as I do, really. Maybe I have the 51% to 49% what I get to do. But in the end, I need to bounce it back. It's uncool if you just yeah, do whatever you want. For sure. Like gotcha. when, you so, a, a, when you're married, you really should be com- communicating. So gotcha. the conversation the time, is kind the of The timeline is com- coming, coming together now. So you, you, like, yeah. you started the crypto thing, and then you rode that big-ass wave up for a little while and you're like yeah. hey i mean do i need money and then you come then then when you then when you come at it right when you come at the conversation with meg you can be like oh well hey i mean look at look at these spreadsheets honey i mean do i need a job <laughs> change yeah, that, that's that's the start of the timeline you're absolutely right because i didn't get i got into general trading since college but really i got in, really knowledgeable and educated by a couple of friends in my circle about cryptocurrency like right before i really pop so i was in a very thankful situation it was about april of 2020s when i started mm. really actually putting money down and yeah think that's a great time to buy if you look at the spreadsheet oh yeah uh, <laughs> look at look at the graph not, go look up the graphs right now, it's, it's great time it's to buy nuts yeah yeah gotcha. so when you're when you've been gifted to that degree you uh mm. could do one of a couple things you can kind of just say oh well that's dope i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing or like all right now that i have this what can i do that no one else gets to what can no one else yeah. do because they don't have the, this asset that I have? Mm-hmm. How can I leverage what I was given to the best benefit, to like the maximizing what I actually cool. provide and receive as far as value? Is yeah. the question, like the, on a pure logic base, that's the driving question that kind of led to where I am now. Is mm-hmm. what is value? What do I want? What, what should I do? And so then, well, yeah, you got, you're coming at the conversation with leverages and I have spreadsheets. I, I can clearly show that I can make like, enough money if this is the option I want to choose. But then I'm like, all right, on the other hand, I'm also going to do probably content creation. I really mm-hmm. like playing games. I'm good enough at playing games that people like watching me play games. So I should do that more often. Maybe I can proceed down that avenue. And so I present that as an option, which is one of the options I'm actively pursuing. So thankfully, yeah, sure. I don't actively pursue but I'm more or less, I'm kind of getting educated about video editing right now. And so I'm focusing more on that side of the bit, which nice. kind of further down the road. Cool. But, yeah. Yeah. So this. So so it's interesting. You almost came at like because a lot of people would, would be like, I'm gonna follow my dreams and go stream in my basement for 24 straight hours and hope I get enough people, right? But you came at this from a very logical perspective, which I think is interesting. So were you like, like you're sitting around, and you're like, well, I got some money. What should I? What what can I like do to fill, do to fill my time? What do I want to do with with this? And like, so were like, were there any other things you thought of, or was like streaming just something that you're like? you're like always like down for that you wanted to give it a try yeah the big thing is especially for streaming and the conversation of streaming is you're kind of right while i was working that last job and i worked there for 10 months at that contract so longer than most of my contracts go and it made me a little the friction got a little high i didn't want to be there and I, they just kept giving me they didn't i don't know they didn't want to fire me I, weird i don't know contracting works kind of interesting but I always wanted to stream, like I've always wanted to. And when you're sitting there working 40 hours a week on something that is truly rotting your brain, yeah. like you're like, I do not want to do this second more of this. Mm-hmm. Anything that you want to do sounds like, like a nirvana. Like it sounds like yeah. I need to do that now. And so coming out of work, I'm like, all right, now I actually have time. You can lean into streaming significantly more. And that's kind of, the, it was just a logical choice. It's what I wanted to do and I was under no financial pressure. And That's so, awesome. and then I've looked at other avenues though, because I'm not, I want to have plan B's, plan C's, you know, mm-hmm. cover your bases. But currently, we're still within, well within the constraints of plan A, which is yes. streaming and video editing, which cool. is what I'm working on the video editing side now, because I want to have that skill set first before I start to lean hard into streaming. Because, yeah. like you said, a lot of people will say, you know what, follow my dreams. Passion alone will carry me. I'm going to go stream for 24 hours straight and get two people to come. Like, <laughs> working smarter, not harder, is a huge thing when you're working something like streaming, mm-hmm. which is more or less digital marketing. You have to create a following in order to actually get the dopamine from doing the work. It's a very strange system, but if no one shows up, you never feel like you did anything. And so you, yeah. you, sometimes you can just sit there, get in a kind of toxic mentality and ask, oh, what did I do all day? Theoretically, you could have just deleted what I did all day and it would affect no one. It starts to get a really toxic mentality. You really got to have yeah. a pretty strong head on your shoulders, screwed on pretty straight, and the key is focus. If you don't have the focus, you'll never get the drive or be able to actually get to do anything. And that's probably the biggest hurdle I've been focusing on. Focus is being able to know what I want to do and not need gotcha. to re- recycle myself up every morning to get out of the 
which I see a lot from most people who work the classic nine to five, is waking up is, is hell. They would rather do anything than go to work. And that seems like no way to live. But that's a very naive thing to say coming from my perspective. So I understand that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Nice. Okay. Yeah. That's, that, that's actually super, super cool. I like that. Because, uh, you know, think about that. And like when I've been thinking about like starting this podcast, I've been completely avoiding mm -hmm. the thought of anyone ever actually watching it. Right. So I'm putting in nearly nothing as far as resources goes into this. So I don't uh, hit the, get that massive weight on my shoulders like you're talking. But for a lot of people streaming, I can definitely see how that could that could take you down a terrible path, and then you can you know just in TV yourself. Yeah, men, it puts you in a pretty compromised mental state. And uh, if, if one thing I would say to anybody who's like in this situation is read marketing material that's targeted towards entrepreneurs, because what you're doing, you are effectively putting yourself into a mental state of an entrepreneur. You are your own boss. It sounds like a great thing, but then you're also responsible for everything. You, mm. you can get completely overwhelmed, and you basically can come to the same negative mindset that entrepreneurs can come to being like your value is directly tied to what you can do because you don't do anything else. So you must be really good at that. And so people start to build expectations and you almost get to in your own head. You're like, Oh my goodness, if I don't get results, then I'm not doing anything. And what do I have to present to the world when they ask me, what did I do? Like, especially if you look at it on a long scale, which is you, you can or you can't, some people shouldn't. We're like, if you're coming to us 20 years later, what did you do for 20 years? Where you can look at that and be like, well, I created this mass wealth. I worked this many hours. I did these all the great things. But like, mm -hmm. you're the only one who has to answer those questions. No one yeah. else really cares. Like, yeah. that's one of the things you have to learn. And I think that's part of just learning as you grow up. Some people never make that conclusion. But as an entrepreneur mindset, when you're your own body, you're, you create your own, you know, deadlines, your own, what the success look like, everything, you have to create that in order to have, a, to have a plan to enact it. You can create a situation where like, I feel successful if one person watches my video. And you can ask yourself, well, sure, why not? This one guy watched my video, I did something. And then that little bit of success can be all you need to say, okay, well, next week when I make one, mm -hmm. I got 20 people showed up to watch my video. And be like, all right, that's like literally 20 more people. Mm -hmm. Sure, you're not pulling in 5 million numbers like some YouTubers, but you're getting 20 people to come and watch your thing. 20 people came and saw something that you created. Some of them even watched yeah. the whole thing. They maybe somebody commented on them. You maybe got one like. You get your first like. And it's, equi <laughs> it's um, equated almost like getting your first dollar. Like Mr. Krabs <laughs> talks about Mr. getting his first me dollar. Million dollar. Me yeah. million dollar. Me million dollar, me first. Like the value of that first like or first dollar, it's that dopamine and that mindset awesome. can, is much more going to lead you to success in the long run as far as a stamina and how long you can actually do this before you burn yourself out. A lot of content creators talk about like streaming burnout, YouTube burnout, you know, Instagram burnout, name the platform. Yeah. You're an entrepreneur. Like that's what you actually, your job, you're your own boss as an, as an influencer. You're your own boss. You're in charge of this, all, all this. Sure, you work for Instagram or you work for Twitter or you work for Twitch as in like that's the revenue which you're kind of getting paid through. So you're kind of their employee in a way. Technically, you're legally a contractor, but you're kind of their employee in a way if you're getting paid for them, but you're your own, you bring your own results. They, could, they kick you out or fire you, but based on whatever they want, pure analytics it has gotcha. nothing to do with you. And so yeah. you are in charge of all of that, where normally you'd have a boss or a social structure at work that kind of keeps that in check. Like you have expectations. You go to a meeting, they tell you what they want. They tell you like a timeline to do it, or maybe they help you work that through and you create a timeline yourself. And you're like, okay, this is what success looks like. Here's our plan to accomplish it. Let's go get it. You create all that on your own. No one's, it's all you. You're everyone in that staff meeting. And so and let, once you can start to rationalize that and realize the situation you're in, you can, you can combat it significantly more effectively, especially mentally. A lot of people who get into a bad spot, it's a rabbit hole. They don't even realize how toxic their mindset can get. Yeah, that They start sure. to just go down and down and down. And like you said, with like the podcasts and stuff, sometimes you'll never even start it. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll get so spiraling down into a little hole that you'll be so worried you won't succeed that you'll never start. And that's failing before you come to the finish, before you even get to the blocks, you've already failed. You've already given up. So nice. that should be seen as, as failure, not some form of success. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm a very success-oriented person, so I suppose that's why I frame it much more like a competition. Mm -hmm. It's helped that. me get to where I am. Awesome. All right, let's take a, let's take a quick intermission here because i got to send that quick text here. Let me, uh, let me stop the recording. 
And we're back. All right. Indeed, so, indeed. Uh, Zach, working off your last question, you're kind of talking about your Twitch stuff. Now you're doing sure. that. So it sounds like you're kind of in like like spin up mode, maybe, where you're working on your editing and stuff like that. Yeah. Instead of going like going hard, like you know, a lot of streamers, right? They're like, mm, I'm treating this like my nine to five. I'm streaming eight hours a day, every day, just hoping I keep getting getting more people. So do you like? And you talked about doing like you know smarter, not harder and things too. So are you doing like social media pushes? Are you like popping around? Well, not like pushes, but you know, like you have accounts sure. on all that stuff, like. Like, what's that look like for your business model? Yeah, right now, I would definitely say it's the in-development stage. It's not quite, like, a full mm-hmm. launch day. It's more like I'm, I've am i streamed a couple dozen times over, like, I'm trying to figure out the right way to go before I go in type thing. Because if a lot of people, like I said, they treat it like they're 9 to 5. They just start whatever they were doing last time, and now they just stream. And they find a lot of success. A lot of people do. But if you go pop up Twitch right now and go to, like, Warzone, Fortnite, Scroll for about 15 seconds and then look at the viewers. Scroll about 15 more seconds. Look at the viewers and then realize you're about a tenth of the way down. Like the amount yeah. of people who have 10 plus viewers is le- like they're in the top 5%. It, blo- they, it, blo- it, blo- it blows viewers. my mind. Like I'll look at and they'll be like on page one and it'll be like, you know, 1,700 people, 1,500 people, 30 people. Mm-hmm. It's the next one. It's like it's just such a weird environment because you're all operating in the same space so it's and it's not like there's a cost necessarily so these people aren't like why would they look farther down the shelf they know other people are yeah. looking at this one yeah and yeah that kind of enters into a pretty complex ecosystem about how Twitch actually runs which is still currently the king like other other apps are bringing up their their game but mm. currently the king is still Twitch as far as pure quantitative viewers like if you want to be a video game streamer you should be on Twitch. It's where like all the hype still is. But Twitch is the worst platform there is for discoverability. You'll never be found on Twitch. You can stream there all you want. You can stream 300 hours a month. No problem. Just keep streaming. Knock yourself out. You'll get nowhere. Maybe you'll start to accumulate an audience super slowly. Maybe get two or three mm-hmm. regular dudes who like put you on their follow and they, they come by when they see you. they're not coming. You can tell them when you stream. They don't care. If yeah. they happen to be on their computer, They'll watch you, maybe, but you're going to be building a very, very slow pyramid that way. That's like yeah. putting all the bricks down yourself. So is that you can, why you were doing smarter YouTube ways for a while? to go about it? What was that? Is that why you were using YouTube for a while there instead of Twitch? Yeah. So I started off just like, let's just see what I can do. I started streaming on Twitch just like a lay of the land, see what's going on, and I'm starting to see like, okay, there's thousands of people here who can't, who aren't passing the bar. They're all stuck beneath the bar. You, then you need to know, where is the bar? Like, what's the bar look like? What's it look like to be above the bar? Start to study who is above the bar. How did they get above the bar? What, did, what strategy did they use to get above the bar? And a lot of people, if you're watching most people's streams, you can only come to the conclusion. Their strategy is to hopefully. <laughs> hopefully. You, you need to wear lower cut shirts, Zach. Yeah. Okay. It, well, I mean, it's now a we've talked discussion. about breast implants, <laughs> but... <laughs> Yeah, that's a completely different... I don't have that strategy, sadly. Twitch <laughs> hasn't quite gone to that level of evolution. <laughs> but uh, a you, need, you evolution need some training. form of strategy. And so you start to realize there's so many different strategies you can really enact if you're trying to just get viewers. But they're all basically... You start to realize you're kind of working in sales. You need to understand a lot more if you're coming from a business mindset, like obviously both of us are. You're effectively kind of... You're selling yourself. You're selling mm-hmm. your stream. What do you offer? Well, if you stream for three hours a day, five hours a day, you offer what you offer. But you'll never be able to sell anything if no one knows what you're selling. You have to, mm-hmm. They have to know what they're going to buy before they buy it. There's very yep. few people who are just going to take you on an early adopter. They're just going to hop in. And I'm the early adopter guy. I mm-hmm. just go to random streams with one dude, and I see what you got. And I put you on like a little monkey show, a little mm-hmm. puppeteer. and you do, a, do your little dance. See if you can entertain me, you plebeian. And then they mm-hmm. go on to it the next guy. Like. It's not a very fun mindset to put yourself in, and you need to be pretty stalwart if you're going to make that your strategy because you're, going, you're really just throwing shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. And yeah. it works. A lot of people have blown up that way, and that's why a lot of people still try it is because they listen to the success stories of people who did that way. And mm-hmm. it's, it's not a very uh, compelling argument that they make in the current scheme. But a lot of people nowadays are saying, like, oh, you need to start on TikTok. TikTok's the way to play, the place to get discovered, and they're absolutely not wrong. Yeah, TikTok is way sure. better than Twitch as far as discoverability. So is YouTube. So is freaking Facebook. Hell, you probably have better luck putting flyers on your on your 
uh, telephone poles outside than you are to just get found in Twitch. It's not a smart strategy, especially not in 2021, mm -hmm. where now not only can you stream on Twitch, you're competing with all of them. You're competing with everyone on TikTok. You're competing with everyone on YouTube. You're competing with everyone. It's one giant ecosystem. And all you have is Twitch putting you at the bottom of the list. They are doing nothing else to help you. They're not going to give you any ad yeah. help. Nothing. You're at the bottom of a list to them. They mm -hmm. see nothing there. They, they, you give them nothing, so they're not going to offer you anything. You need yep. to prove to Twitch you can be profitable. Then that's when they might start helping you roll the ball a little bit. You know, they'll get you in the partnership program, stuff like that, which actually way down. Usually it's affiliate program, then you go to partnership. Like that. That's how you get paid. But it, they help you there. But the early guys, they help no one. So you really need a strategy. Yeah, and that's yeah. more like where I am. That's why I'm working. Like what I'm doing every day isn't necessarily looking to come up with my strategy. It's honing my skills. Mm -hmm. Something I can, something, something that kind of comes from blue collar mindset. A lot of, uh, pe books I read in that field are saying, if nothing else, hone the fundamentals of what your craft demands. Mm -hmm. You may not have the bread butter winner idea yet. It might be coming down the line. Steve Jobs didn't wake up and was born like, hey, I know what I'm doing this life. Like, you may not know what your, your shtick is going to be yet. Your strategy is, might not know, be known, but you can fundamentally hone those skills. Whether, like I said, right now, in this last month, I've been doing video editing. You could be doing audio editing, which is why I'm really interested in a lot of the filters that can be put on OBS. But it's like that. You can really start to hone. You can study and real, like, have a much better strategy. Uh, a really huge influencer on Twitch called Ludwig did this, and he made it pretty popular as like a philosophy. As he realized he wanted to stream, and then he just spent time like, researching and deciding how he wants to do it. And he did, then once he found like, his, his shatter point, his like, entry into this game, he just went in at mass velocity. He took everything he had, all of his financial health and well-being, everything he could, and then just honed it and pushed into that gap. And he made, right. he's one of the most like, successful streamers on Twitch. And he did it in about two years. Most of the big streamers on Twitch started, and they've been there for like eight to ten years. These mm -hmm. huge dance, Tin the Tapman, stuff like that, Shroud. Like, they've been there most of their life. Like, they've got mm -hmm. the early adopter of Drenefit. They got there when Twitch was still in its infancy. That's when they started streaming. We, we are in that situation where we can't do that. That's not gotcha. an option we have. We need to be clever. And so that's why I really am much more a subscriber of the know what your strategy is before you just start doing it. Because mm -hmm. you might really cause a lot more harm psychologically than good if you just try and try and try, getting no success. And if you're really tied how your value system and your structure of dopamine, whatever you want to call it, is you know, attributed, if it's really tied to success, you're putting yourself in a very unfortunate position where you can't get success because it's not something you get to actually control. You're not the one who forces them to get in that stream of yours. You just have mm -hmm. to compel them. You never can force them to get there. So you can't even control that one thing that you would call success. You can't control. You can yeah. control, however, how good you are at these skills, how fast you can, what type of tools you can use, mm -hmm. how you can recognize certain problems, properly address them before they ever can arrive. You're gonna be, you can do those. You can yeah. definitely hone those things way faster than you're ever going to force some success out of something you can't even control. Yeah, and that's I like more, that. I would say, the philosophy that I adopt when doing this more streaming mindset and like how I'm going about it is focusing on honing fundamental skills that will bring value more so than trying to tie some success to how much I stream or yeah. how much people are in my stream. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, I like, I like that. That, that, that. That advice that goes across a lot of different fields too. So I feel like, I feel like that's, that's pretty banging. So just uh, yeah. so going going in going in here, no life jackets. Not many to put you on the spot, but what's the okay, most okay. viewers you've had on a stream? Uh, proof. I think the most I've seen, I think, is eighteen at a time. That was no. in it's like March, it was a while ago. I was streaming that, but the particular reason for that is I was streaming on a pretty long schedule. I would say like I was I was in there for like six hours or so. Like I was in there for longer than I usually. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of started to uh, get momentum. I started to accumulate people, but yeah. the next day you stream and it's back to one. So it's not a, you're not really building a long-term, just pure short-term momentum, which isn't enough. It's not enough to break through the wall. It's gotcha, not enough gotcha. momentum to break through the wall. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Gotcha. And you stream, it's still most, are you mostly Tarkov still? Or are you trying to like not get your ass tied down to one game? Because I feel like if yeah, I was streaming... I, will, I don't want to like even set the expectation that I'm playing the same game every time. Yeah. You, you absolutely hit it on the nose. And it's probably way worse than you think. Uh, in the current streaming ecosystem, if you get labeled like this is your shtick, especially if you do it for as long as I've done it, which is since February, like if you just stream one game, that's what you do. 
That is your value to everyone else. If they even see you're playing something else, they're not common. You can get to be, everyone wants to be this golden egg called the variety streamer. The variety streamer has free reign to stream whatever he wants. Exactly. Because he didn't put himself in that basket. Yeah, their That's product fundamental isn't, of it. It isn't related to the game they're playing. Their product is themselves. They're a, it's all personality exactly. based. And they've got enough of that that they can play whatever Because anyone else can play the game you're playing. Yeah. yeah. It's like you have to bring something unique to the table. Mm. And like you said, I, variety streamers are much more known for just being comedically funny or maybe they're just like currently great at every game they play. Mm-hmm. Like inherently they just have a ridiculously fast learning speed and yep. they can be almost pro level in a couple of days. Some people like that do exist. That's probably not, I'm probably not gifted to that degree. I'm pretty good on average, but I'm not pro level in anything. Mm-hmm. So why would I hope I could be at every Most people come on a base on just pure comedic merit, which is much more where I come at come in as like my general ballpark of how I want to stream is co- people want to come for me, not necessarily what I'm playing. Unfortunately, that's the hardest thing to create. That's the, no, I suppose it's the hardest. The hardest thing to create is probably being like a hot tub. It's pretty hard. You, uh, <laughs> you need to be gifted with some You need to be uh, quite gifted. Large some, uh, <laughs> tracts of land. <laughs> you need to be in a different situation than what I'm with. I was yeah, at this so I, current I, time. I went on Twitch on Twitch the other day because I was like doing doing some uh, some boring stuff like yeah. budgeting and whatnot. And I was like, oh, I'll put Twitch on my other monitor. And I scrolled through, and like, my God, like, like don't get, don't get, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm not I'm not gonna be some scrub sitting here being like, yeah, they're just they're, people just waving their titties out and getting viewers, man. Yeah. Okay, like yeah. the amount of Big work brain. that I see them putting in, like they've got their whole like background all set up perfectly for what they're doing. They're doing killer makeup. Like it's insane. They probably wake up two hours doing their makeup. And then they, they, I don't know if they do their own outfits or what they got to get them tailored unless you just purposely order them four sizes too small, I suppose. And you have the right. Yeah, body I, type, I have but... no quarrels whatsoever. With exactly. That. They are, they're smart. They're smart. They're utilizing what they have. It's, it's uh, people it's, in Twitch it works chat really that. well. And a lot, a lot of the time, like, like, cause it's, it's, it's a very unique skill set to actually be able to stream well. And a lot, of, a lot of like the, like the, uh, like, uh, uh, I get what you call him a hot tub streamer. I, I'm completely out of the game here, but you know, I think now they have a different category for him, but everyone knows the hot tub streamer is not incorrect. Anyway, That's when you go on Twitch looking for boobies, do. right? These streamers, like they're actually really good. Like I could, like I would not be nearly as, as good at this, um, as they were. I think, I think the boobs almost like it draws in more viewers, but it also draws in a lot of, uh, unnecessary hate. I think it's a dub. It's a dub yeah, I, I definitely hear you. I really yeah. do. And that's why I, most people who like come at it with so much aggression against the streamer, the, the, the category you're trying to dance around is called titty streamers. Aye. That's what they're referred to. Titty gotcha. streamers is when you, and it's like, it's not, that doesn't mean you stream in your hot tub. That doesn't make you a titty streamer. There are dudes who do hot tub streams. So like, a yeah. twit titty streamer is you clearly everyone can clearly see your main strategy here is to shake what you got because like mm-hmm. that's how you're getting people in like yeah. there are, just because you're a girl and just because your tits are does not make you a titty streamer mm. there are some very attractive girls who would whoop my ass in a lot of games yeah sure they can show cleavage that's fine that's what they want to do the titty streamers are the ones who like oh a ten dollar dono i'll write your name it <laughs> i'm like really I'm, no, oh, oh, really oh, on the nose i do remember that i remember because there was like there was a thing and they had like whiteboards up and like oh i'll write your name on the board if you donate and then they'll like go over there yeah. and bend over and they clearly yeah. stand in like certain ways to accentuate cer- like it's one thing to like make you look make yourself look your best I, I have no problem with that but when you have to stand up to wipe the whiteboard every 30 seconds and you do it yeah. as slowly as possible this isn't an accident here this isn't you know, like, oh, I'm this is how of, I usually stand up. I'm curious if, 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 the, if this is actually a problem or if it's a perceived problem, right? I'm wondering if the market segment of people who go out there looking for titties on Twitch, like, if those streamers are actually stealing away any viewers from, like, That's the who's thing. playing games, right? I don't think so. I don't think the same people, like, are going yeah. there, you know? I feel like it's a completely you're, separate. You're system. absolutely right. There's an argument made that like, oh, though, that if they weren't going to go to a titty streamer, maybe they'd play a video game and maybe they'd watch. Like, sure, you can make some gymnastics argument like that, but you're absolutely right. They're not directly competing with you who's playing Tarkov. Yeah. It's not like, like, it's not they're, like somebody they're, booted they're up to Twitch and is like, Twitch, but, hmm, yeah, it's should not... I watch a titty hot tub streamer or should I watch Tarkov? Right. That's, they're not weighing this decision in their head. 
Yeah, there's nobody who's like, I'm going to go watch some watch Shroud kick ass at PUBG, and then they see some titties, and they're just magically sucked in, right? I mean... They're like, oh, shit. Well, this is, cross this off is, this, this night. Time the, to get my this wallet. This is the internet. I mean, it works to a certain extent, but, like, people mm -hmm. people can handle this, okay? They're not getting redirected so quickly. Okay. You're, you're absolutely right. There's a, and then like a final point there. Mm. There's a Twitch streamer who uh, used to work in the adult sector uh, named Sasha Gray, who says it all the time. She's like, listen... Go to, there's other websites for this. Like, you can, it's not that hard. It's the internet. Like, you people are just in the wrong website. Like, how do you, <laughs> she's just appalled that they're actually, like, coming to this website for this. Like, go somewhere else. There's all plenty of other websites. She can name a few. So, yep. it's kind of funny. And I think you're absolutely right. You're not really competing with those people in hot tubs if you're just playing games. And that's why I don't think it's very logical to really bring a lot of hate to the streamer. They're just playing the game. Yeah, like, that's it's definitely an interesting one. By the way, never heard of Sasha Gray. I have no idea who like I just I actually made know, her name up. Never. Up. Yep. Yeah. Completely. That's that's not even real. Completely fabricated. It was uh, just, <laughs> I happen to have my Fifty Shades of Gray novel right here, and so I saw Gray. It was Sasha. It was, was she's on my there, Snapchat. On the talking cocktail earlier. napkin. <laughs> completely fabricated name. Excellent. Excellent. You know, he was sitting there, and you know, he was looking at his cat. He's like, "Oh, cats are often named Sasha. His walls are gray." Pulled it right out. It's, uh, yeah, like, it's just like John Doe. It's just a simple name. Why, what, what, what could that possibly? All right, let me let me see what I what I, what I got here on my on my list of questions. We're getting towards the end here, which is awesome. All right. Oh, here's I a good one. Ready. What would you in middle school think about you now? Right. I like, think this question often, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw that it was something that you were brought up the other day, and so I've, I've thought about it often, and I realized that this answer really goes one of two ways. One is it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, middle school you isn't currently you. And then it gets to be a really fun argument about, well, who, is, and then it gets really philosophical and it's going to be about a 20 minute debate. So, uh, but as far as the fundamental simple question you're asking, if you could teleport back to seventh grade and look yourself in the eye and that person knows everything about you, like they've got like a little mm -hmm. crash course on everything up to date. Yep. What are their thoughts on your current situation? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would probably say, I think it's middle school maybe pretty uh, pretty pogged. Like, yeah. Wow, this is this turned out way better than I thought it would. Mm -hmm. Like, I've always yeah. been decently, especially when I was younger, way before I met you. I was always decently, outwardly optimistic, but internally very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. I was always prepared for the worst possible outcomes, at it basically every time, which kind of led to a bit of I wouldn't say like a depressive mindset. But if you're constantly like thinking on the worst possible situations, you really should be spending more time thinking on like something a little bit more positive. So it leads to a bit of a negative attitude or a cynical attitude to a degree. Mm -hmm. And that was much more me in middle school. So the fact that I'm still alive, my middle school me would be pumped. Yeah. He's like, you know what? You're alive. You're, fr you're married. You play video games and you got a lot of money. Like, what's the problem? There are no cons in middle school me right now. I like it. But maybe I like I'd say if there's one thing, my hair's not nearly as blonde as it used to. Mm -hmm. It used to be really blonde. Yeah. I, not quite blonde. Look, it's about the same blonde as Brett. When he showed up freshman year. No, oh, yep, yep, Like yep. pretty blonde. Like yeah. it's because both of us were outside a lot because we both yeah. worked at camps. Not the same camp, different camps, but we both spent most yeah. of our days under the sun. Definitely. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I think about that about that one sometimes. It's like when I think about it for myself, it's a weird one because middle school me, like I'd probably say from like fifth grade to seventh grade at least, I was I was depressed to crap. I was a ter I, I like I, I look back and I have a very hard time thinking about it because I was I, I was just a terrible terrible person. Whenever I look back, I'm like, wow, that's horrific. So I feel like there'd be there'd be two things. One, one would be like, oh damn, that didn't turn out too bad. But then there'd be another side that'd be like, Ugh, he took such a mainstream lifestyle <laughs> because middle school me was like was like peak cynical about everything, every single thing that could be considered mainstream. Like I was a hipster of, of hipsters. Like I think personally. Do you, how many self-hating hipsters do you think there are now that like being hipster is a label and it's quite mainstream? I always oh I, always, I definitely I feel like there's a lot of self-hatred in those types of communities. <laughs> a hipster doesn't like being called a hipster. Exactly. You know, that may be what they are. So it's the, it's this weird thing where you're like you're a hipster, right? You want like a small community. You want to be a part of it. You want to know more than other people. You want to be different. But so you have these competing things of like oh I'm a human. I want a community that does this, but I want to do things that aren't normal and be special. And it's like, these are directly competing. 
Oh, you get like like you just you're with people yeah. until they get big and then they sold out and you move on to someone else who's indie, right? It's just it's like that classic walk because it's ah, I don't know. It, it fascinates it fascinates me. Mm. It, yeah, I hear you. It's de- it's very similar, but not quite the same. I never was hipster. I was I wasn't cynical enough to be hipster, but I was cynical enough that I didn't want anyone else to be like me to a degree. I didn't like being compared to people, but it wasn't to like I need to be unique. It's more like I'm just better than all of you. Like very yeah. arrogant mindset. Oh yeah. Uh, which I mean, 100%. as you grow into high school, I mean, a lot of people come into high school extremely arrogant. Uh, mm-hmm. It helps actually. A small note for middle school, sixth, uh, well, seventh, eighth grade, I was homeschooled. I actually didn't go to a public oh, school yeah, that's right. because of, of basically sixth grade. I got well, it wasn't the sole reason, but it was a, a big reason. Even you, I was like four inches shorter than most people of that age. Now sixth grade, mm-hmm. short boy. Really scrawny, the skinniest you can oh, get. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like feeling you. the story. I'm feeling very, yeah, <laughs> very weak. You're small. You're weak. Girls are growing big and tall and stronger than oh, you. Yeah. You really provide little to this discussion here. And so I, I pretty much, I just got bullied into the ground. Yeah. To the point where I'm like, screw this noise. I'm leaving. And so mm. I left. And then uh, I hit like a, like a 13 inch growth spurt, and mm-hmm. uh, came back at six two. Uh, probably oh, just shy of six three. Just a little bit shorter than I am now, but not by much. And uh, Man, I'm just imagining yeah, all your no classmates like you, you just left and then you came back two years later from your parents' lab with like yeah. sticking like, out your things, just like, stitches oh God, across your Zach. arms where they inserted the extra pieces. <laughs> yeah. It really helped because I had actually infiltrated the jock community. Oh my because goodness. my, my uh, entry back was my brother Brian mm-hmm. forcing me to come to the weight room one day. And weight room started at 6 a.m. It, uh, mm-hmm. It's annoying. It's hard. It's hard in Minnesota, where it's very, very cold uh, in the mornings, particularly the mornings, to get up to drive somewhere to be there at 6 a.m. before school. Not. Mm. I'm amazed he got me there. I truly yeah. am. One of Brian's most crowning feats is how he dragged me to the weight room. Peak achievement. And then, uh, yeah. yeah, quite an achievement. And then that, from there, that's where I actually meet all the weightlifting kids, kids I can hockey or football before i met everyone else i was like mm-hmm. the real first coming back like, oh my gosh zach you're so tall and i started getting bigger bulking up mm-hmm. then i went back to school and so i wasn't like nearly the size i am now but i wasn't quite as scrawny as i was i was yeah i was still a very competitive at the time i was competitive in swimming mm-hmm. um, which makes you really skinny even more you don't really get bigger by swimming you kind of just get more yeah just, yeah especially once you get older grab the corner but, and you pull it out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you just kind of made me bigger get bulkier mm. then i joined the football team started to bulk off the base try to go into linemen it's pretty fun but i would came back and having a little bit of physical strength very big for confidence and self-esteem boosting probably boosted it too far like i said got a little arrogant oh yeah uh, it's, times, ba- it's bound I'm like, it's bound to i'm uh i may not be stronger than you but i'm faster than you like there was always some way i was better than someone and something there was no one who was just my equal no one was better than me at everything if they yep. were more athletic than me i'd kill them in every single video game i played it, it yep. didn't really matter. And the better part is I was also yep. not a 4.0 student, but I was, like you said earlier, yeah. generally I, I excelled at test taking. I was very, very good at Let's test taking. Let's not walk around so this, Zach. I, We're geniuses. <laughs> Let's not beat around the bush. We're <laughs> basically genius. Yep. But uh, I, I was also in the academic group. So it kind of, I was in like every group. And then I was in the gaming groups from being like a nerd and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I kind of existed in every group, which made me very arrogant. Made me realize like I'm a jack of all trades. I'm better oh, yeah. than most people at something. I still to oh, this yeah. day I'm really balanced someone who's literally my match in everything. But there are people yeah. who are better than you and will always be better than you. So being the best is kind of irrelevant. Chasing a I dream gotcha. to be the best will either make you an Olympian or very sad. Yeah. So I, I think that's the nice. philosophy I kind of switched off of as I came to out of high school. I was like I'm done with high school. Mm-hmm. I, I scored what I scored. Next race, go and do something gotcha. else. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's kind of cool. It's like a, it's like a similar arc for for me, kind of in uh, when I came out of out of middle school, right? I think I started to come out of my depression in eighth grade around there, and I and I came into it. I kind of made this realization. I'm like, you know what, Brian, you kind of do like people, actually. Um, you can not be a total jackass. And so I I start I start hanging out, but I I was always I was always like my, thi- my my like in middle school. I thought my thing is that I don't do things, right? So I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that extracurricular. All right, special. Like, and it, it never worked, right? So, like, I think eighth, eighth grade, I, like, joined the co-ed softball team. And I'm like, mm, mission accomplished, got past that. And in high school, I started, I started doing more stuff. But because I started, I, like, I came to this big epiphany. And now, you ready, you ready for this? This is some, this is some big thing. I, I realized that 
people like people who do cool things. Yeah, yeah, right? So, like, it was just this sudden realization, like, oh, I should do things. And so I started doing things. And see, w like you're thinking, you're, you're looking at other people like, oh, I can beat them in this thing. They, they're better at me than this thing. My, my mind, because I, would, I, I went full, full hardcore, and I'm like, I got I to gotta pretend that I'm the best at everything, right? Mm. And so my mental thing mm. was like, okay, gotcha. They may be better than me at this, but I mean, if I had, like, you know, done the stuff they'd done up to this point, if I picked that up in sixth grade, I'd totally be better than, better than them. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, that's where I'm at. Like, m like, personally, myself, it's still to this day, it's my, probably my biggest fault. I think I could do anything, and I think I'd kill at, like, anything, right? I'm just not going to put mm -hmm. the time into everything. It's impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm seeing a big Olympic bodybuilder coming out of you. <laughs> oh yeah, right. <laughs> like, like I don't. It's it's not going to happen, right? But it's because I've chosen not to go down that path, Zach. It's not because uh, I you, couldn't. I think I. It was it was your <laughs> own agency that decided not to. So exactly. you let them win. It's the equivalent of I let you win. Just exactly. In the long term. Now it's now it's a fine term. line to walk, right? Because you know I I I, I got to dial dial it back and be socially, uh, you know responsible Aware. enough not to be a total douchebag and take this yeah. to the full extent in public but yeah it's uh <laughs> anyway let's see yeah here. i, I definitely I got, hear you uh, i think i got one more one more question in me here, oh, I got here. one zinger all right let's pick oh let's pick this this fun one that i randomly came, came up with here all right so pick some friends that you would like to steal the declaration of independence with and what are their heist roles i can start off here and let you think about it for a second okay okay all right so I, I, I got mine in here, and so I'm obligated to bring my wife on this journey, right? And so I feel like if we're stealing the Declaration of Independence, that her, like, sewing and embroidery machine access should play in. So I, I think we're going to replace it with an embroidered copy. So, like, from a distance and on the cameras, it, like, they think it's still there. But they get down there, and it's just, like, crocheted. It's just, like, stretchy. So I think, I think, that, that, I think that's, that's where I, I got to bring, bring, bring Debbie into this. And then uh, the other one that I had written down here is that I want, I really want my brother to take like the Mission Impossible style role of like popping out of vents and dodging lasers. Cause like, like, like he, he's, a, he's a short stocky fellow, right? He's built for this role. Like he's actually not really a gymnast. He did take gymnastics though. I think he's completely capable it, with, with enough training, okay? Of becoming that like ninja role and, uh, and popping that. And then I have Brett as the getaway driver, but the stipulation is that I wouldn't tell Brett we're stealing the Declaration of Independence. I wanna, I wanna be like, hey, we're gonna go in real quick, and like if we come sprinting out, we dive in the back, go, 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 and then he finds out that we're stealing the Declaration of Independence because I think that's the perfect scene. Uh, it, 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 it's just, uh, I it's see. just prime. I also want Maggie to be our man in the chair, right? I want Maggie to be sitting at your house, being like. Okay, camera three is a go, except she doesn't know how to do any of this, right? And so <laughs> so we're, we're telling her what buttons to hit and stuff, and it's just not working. And anyway, that's where, like, the, 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 the catch in the heist comes, you know? When they're, yeah, like, on to us and we have to run out, and then it's the, it's the interest. So that's where that's coming from. And then I, I, I think you and I at this point are just going to have to be, like, the con men trying to, like, in disguise walk our way in there. So I think uh, that's, that's the list that I had going. <laughs> yeah, I would. Uh, so you're going for a try now. Your, your team's gonna be pretty funny. Oh yeah, it's gonna be a great movie. This is your team's kind of a great exactly. movie. Exactly. This is this team's gonna tell a story, right? Now maybe yeah, other people go for gonna, an effective yeah. team. I do not. <laughs> <laughs> we aren't expecting to get away with this. If we do, that'd be pretty dope. But <laughs> the story is the main point here. Hopefully, they'll just let us go off the pad on the. I would have to say, if I was being serious, trying to steal it. I need a smaller team more than a bigger team. I, most people can't, their mouth, you never know. They might ruin the plan. They need a small, specialized mm -hmm. team, a hit and blow. I think the most effective would be cause, we need somebody to cause a diversion. Somebody has to create a fake, like, I wouldn't say something nearly as bad as like an actual, like, real problem, but something that they think something really bad could happen, so they have to respond in mass. Something like a, a Grand Theft Auto. Like, just go steal a car. And then just yep. go run into other cars. <laughs> I'm sure. Just make as much noise as you can. But I need to, they have to be like a stunt driver. I need someone who either has the, the pure balls to drive like an insane man. <laughs> like that the police can't follow you down. Like you're cutting through like bicycle trails and shit. Like someone who just has brass balls 
uh, and can learn to drive really well, or somebody who just is a really, really good driver. Now, sadly, I don't know any pro drivers, um, <laughs> but somebody I think who could just be effective enough to cause enough of a commotion. Mm -hmm. I think I would have. To, I'd put. I'd probably put David Harper on this job. I think David Harper can create so. an effective commotion, and at the same time, also, he probably could get away with it. Like he might now, be able to talk think, himself out now, of it. My, my favorite part, the best part about about the, about your idea here is that David mm -hmm. Harper can be a total wild card, right? Let's say that you're stealing it, and it's, for some reason it's underwater. Doesn't matter what David Harper is doing. He is committed. He will. Yeah. He will be in. He is he's fully invested in whatever you need him to do. He will train. He will prepare. He'll think he's the best man for the job, no matter Which what. Which is great. Doing. Mm -hmm. the, the the dude creating the distraction. His job is just be confident and time. He just has to buy time, and so he doesn't even. We don't need to tell him that that we're doing something else. He he just needs to know the job. He doesn't need more information. So if he gets caught. He has no information. He can't rat us out. He just, all, all he needs is the confidence that this is my job, and I'll hook up a sound system that just plays nothing but Eminem. It'll be fine. He'll just drive around Washington, D.C., make a ton of noise, and then just try to get as many cops on his tail and book it. Mm -hmm. like, that's all he needs to do. That's his Heck job. Yeah. Of course, it's a pretty obvious feint. They, they've watched these movies before. They know that there's probably, if there's an extraction like this, to expect to be on alert. So you have to hit before they get to be really on to realize what you're so that's where you invite Nicolas Cage. I feel like they'll, they can never expect nice. it. If you can somehow, but I, I, he hasn't answered my calls, so I can't, I, I don't think I can. But if I can get him, I think, I think they'll never expect it. They'll never expect you it. Know, if they saw Nicolas you know Cage, they'd have to give up I really, I, I feel, I, you know, I don't know where you got this idea from, but I feel like he's perfectly suited towards this operation. I, I just, I, I can what. see it. I feel like I, it's, I, there. I, it's, it's like there. deja vu. <laughs> yeah, but, and then, we, yeah, I think you have a good point. I have never seen the inside of the Capitol building, so I have no idea what it actually mm. looks like. And I've watched the movie a long time ago. But I'm imagining a nice glass case behind a vaulted door. We it's need some there. method of entry, which means we need somebody who knows power tools. I think Thomas is going to be our drill guy. He's going to have to drill oh, through the yeah. door. And uh, his job, just get through that door. If he, he'll hit it with his head. He, he will get you in that door. He's, before he's, he vision he will is figure out a, met, a method here. He will, he'll get it I, perfect. I imagine he'll like do something where he'll, like, he'll, fi mm. he'll, he'll figure out some way, some way of slicing it. It'll be like a di one of those diamond cutters that firefighters use to get through steel. <laughs> he'll <laughs> shear it over. It and, work. Then it, and then he'll like send his dog on a rope. Like it'll jump through. <laughs> and it'll like get distracted and start tearing up books and shitting everywhere. Uh, but it'll eventually get the declaration. Just do this normal thing. I would think... Uh, and we need some, right, we may need some front men to just kind of like, to get caught on purpose, but can get out of it. Like, you can't pin it on them. They simply are just impeding mm -hmm. you. And I think that's where our job can come in. We can filibust. We are effectively filibusters. Our job, to get in the way. On the close, or, or the close team for getting in the way. Mm -hmm. David hopefully has taken most of the heat. But should something be problematic and somebody's got to take a fall, just like, you know, tackle a police officer or mm -hmm. start talking or like just run, start running. So somebody, ha somebody has to chase yeah, you. Spill your bag of groceries like, and be like, oh, oh, no, could you help we're, me? Yeah, oh. We're the distractions. We're the close range distractions. I like it. We are, we're, we're close in on the team. But the first time they go into danger, we're the one going to have close range distraction. And we I need like somebody it. discreet to be the carry man. We need somebody maybe injured. Pot injured would be really good. Maybe like a disability of some form. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I think we could pass, we could pass Zoe. Off as a as a utility Ooh. dog. She's got the dog. She's got. Yeah. She has a service dog. Ain't no we one get her some stop blacked out glasses. Dog. Yeah, we make her think they're blind. Yeah. Yeah, I get her some blacked out glasses or just some disability that she just completely can fake. It doesn't have to be very convincing. It just has to be enough that they get us. Exactly. We don't have to fake the a problem. disability. She's she a just redhead. needs to sneak by. And then Roman. Roman's gonna be our grab man. He's gonna oh, be going yeah. actually going through he's, with the deed. He's he can't afford it. to leave Prince behind. Who's mm -hmm. gonna check a dog's Prince, huh? And mm -hmm. I think I think I think Zoe could get him trained enough that he won't oh, yeah. harm it to a degree that is hurt. Maybe we'll have mm -hmm. to have a carry case for somebody put it in once he brings it out. We'll have to put it in there. But I'm not sure how we're gonna. I don't know if leaving a dummy behind is gonna be worth our time yeah, i feel maybe like maybe not i mean i think they'll figure it out at this point but <laughs> they'll figure it out yeah they might just print something <laughs> off and slap it down there but we're never gonna fool them we're never gonna be in a situation mm. where we fooled them that this is actually secretly this is the declaration of independence of course like we're not gonna fool them with that. oh 100 i don't think we're gonna fool a real forensic officer we just need to fool the guard we just need to mm. fool the guy who looked at it and said it's still there mm -hmm. he just needs to buy a few seconds so 
We can really put any UPS copy down. As long as it's maybe it a roughed up canvas, little mm -hmm. synthetic aging of it. Yeah, you could drop it in some, I think like you do some vinegar, vegetable oil treatment to it. You yeah, totally I think do. I would have, I think Debs and Maggie would be in charge of trying to figure that one out. Because mm -hmm. I have no idea how you admit age a document like that. I Maggie's anal enough to look it up, and Debbie make us a cake. is anal enough to enact it. <laughs> so Maggie will research how to do it, and Debbie will enact the actual plan of how it can be done. <laughs> I and like then, uh, it. I feel like if we had a man in the chair, you need somebody who's detail-oriented, somebody who can focus on a lot and is actually very techy. I have a really good friend in my other, but I mean, you don't know who it is. He'd be amazing. That's Something. basically what he does. But nice. uh, we play battle royales, and he is just, he's just—he's like he's the On call man. Of things, if I'm not calling the shots, he is. Dang. Solid but business. I would probably man in the chair. Man in the chair. I agree. We need a man chair, and we need an escape driver. Mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can't rely on Zoe escaping because she might actually get too much attention because she drives too fast. Her That's normal driving would definitely get us caught. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't want that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Somebody safe, but fast enough in a pinch to flee. I don't know if I found a driver. I'll have to scout lemons more. Find scout my driver. Lemons more. We'll get. We'll get. We'll get. Some, we're gonna contact the lemons judge. What was that guy's name? Nick. Nick. We're gonna <laughs> contact the lemons judge that was there. He'll come in a Ford Tempo, and he'll drive us away. <laughs> no. Oh, that's, that's perfect. I love it. I love it. That, I mean, it has to kind of be a Honda Accord, right? Like, I feel like mm. the Honda Accord with the wagon. Where are we going to find one just... of those? They're so rare. I, I know they are full mm. of sauce seats I mean, they stuff. have those that's racing the engines. Way. It's VTEC, yo. <laughs> yeah, and who's going to put a roll cage into one? We'll, we'll need it's one, rough. definitely, I'm sure. It'll be tough. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think I would need the, 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 the flaws of my plan. requires I need somebody who's good at being a guy in the chair. And somebody who can drive that I can trust can still get ditch the police, hmm. but is not going to be reckless enough to hit the police. <laughs> I feel like I zoe my C red and hit a police mm -hmm. officer. Like, yeah, start playing well, it off. I mean, you know, her hair might just fly in front of her face, and she'll definitely see red. <laughs> It'll. <laughs> I wonder if she just always sees red. A little tint of red. Always to rest. Something back. She in has her freckles eyes, on filter. her pupils. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Part of being Irish. No worries. She'll never know this podcast exists. You can make all the all the Zola until you invite things. her onto it. This podcast isn't gluten free. She can't listen. <laughs> <laughs> she needs a life jacket. Ah uh, man, you know I think we're deep enough in this podcast that nobody's listening. So um, I think we should. Uh, since we talked about uh, seeing the Declaration of Independence, I'm just going to wax philosophical about National Treasure for a hot second here. I <laughs> think that movie is one. That, to, in my opinion, is one of the perfect movies ever made right like you look at that thing it's not like an award-winning movie but that what does that have to do with it being perfect all right that movie sets out yeah. to do a thing and it's accomplished perfectly how the director intended Nicolas Cage does every line perfectly because it was a Nicolas Cage movie right you can make fun of Nicolas Cage's acting but it's a Nicolas Cage movie you want that ridiculousness. That movie is perfect. Yeah, he leans into it very well. 100%. And I feel like I haven't seen I think I haven't seen National Treasure since sophomore year of college, I bet. I haven't it. watched it in But it's kind of a movie that you can years. watch multiple times. Oh, for sure. You don't just have to watch it once. It's like a lot of those movies are more like a mystery vibe. Mm -hmm. You kind of watch it once. You kind of can't watch it twice because you get the shtick. Yeah. Like you know what M. Night Shyamalan's going to do mm -hmm. here. Like you know the spoiler. But yeah. the spoiler, oh, he's going to, spoilers, by the way, he's going to steal the Declaration of Independence. It's, uh, <laughs> what? That's the show. <laughs> like, that's what you get. That's uh, the only spoiler just, you get. So what, what I love about, I, I've never found anyone who doesn't like National Treasure, right? Like, I, I, I don't, like, if they exist, it's probably just Maggie, right? And she just hates things. So that doesn't, that doesn't count. Doesn't, doesn't count. But National Treasure is so good. And, like, the thing is, like, it came out when we were, like, kids, right? When you, like, don't understand when things are necessarily ridiculous. I thought this was, like, a magnum opus action movie. Like, it was, oh, like, was a, a big deal. Because I remember I saw the commercials. And I'm like, oh, they're going to steal the Declaration of Independence. That makes total sense. I'm six. And, like, <laughs> then it – so, like, going back and watching it later, I'm like, oh, my gosh. This is, like, actually a hilarious premise. This makes no yeah. sense. I'm so in. Now we got to watch it again. <laughs> oh, Those, is that stream on that Amazon? One. You better, you better figure out where that stream's at. Cause I, we, you know, should we just uh, extend the podcast and watch National Treasure right now? <laughs> <laughs>
I, I don't know. I have. I can't be yeah, on that. I, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to stop here pretty quick. But uh, where does he stream though? I don't know. Oh, what this is ridiculous! They're hitting it with a six point nine out of ten. I mean, I, maybe well, I do. Okay, I, I, gotta, if, I gotta appreciate what it is. If that's on well. purpose, I I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's like scripted there's, in here. There's no change. way anyone actually gave negative reviews unless it was to get to that number. So I think we're good. Ah. Hulu or Prime is a U.S. currently, so it looks like Hulu and or Prime. Ooh, banging! Man, all right, such a good movie. Oh, so Alrighty, good. you wanted to right, wrap well, we'll, it out? Yeah, I think we'll wrap it up on National Treasure and call it good. This has been the No Life Jackets podcast with Zach. Hey, Demo look, episode. Wanna, you want to plug any of your like your your business? I don't know. Like, there's gonna be like two people who watch this, so you might get two more watchers. Like, hey man, that's like triple mine right now. I'm sure that math works <laughs> easily. out easily. <laughs> CPM up way uh, up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll plug. Uh, I pretty much you just find me on Malik 3K. Uh, Malik 3K, the letter three, the numerically, the three. I'm on YouTube, I'm on Twitch. You won't find much of me, although I do got a pretty big YouTube video I put out this last week. I'm pretty proud of it. You won't find much about it, but yeah, if you catch me live, make sure you hop in. Don't come in for, for financial advice. Um, I will not give it to you. I do not want to get sued. But if you want to come in and just talk about finances, I can probably do that too. But I no will worries. preface it all with, this is not financial advice. This is just what I do. So yes, take Doge that Coin. at its word. That is financial advice. I'm a financial advisor. Buy Doge. It's going <laughs> up. <laughs> That's the Dump only it way all. it can yeah. go. Go buy some property in Maine right now. Hundred <laughs> percent. Like it's at it's it's at what like I don't know like forty cents right oh, now. I don't. I try not to follow like they, Doge too like much because it'll make me want to buy. When Bitcoin drops, they can actually only do dollar increments, so it can't get lower. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about. It. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that would be great. Yeah, it's sitting at what? 28 cents. Wow, it is cents. down there. It is down. It was up to like 77 Alrighty. for a bit. Anyway, well, let's wrap this up. See you guys later. Peace yeah, out. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'm always glad I could be the pilot episode. You know it. There might even be another one. <laughs> <laughs> a follow-up. We have more questions, I'm sure. All the time. But I'm